Welcome to Under the Fig Tree Podcast. In today's episode, hosts Rev. Micah Glenn and Rev. Dr. Ben Haupt sit down with a special guest as they meditate under the fig tree. What's up, what's up, what's up? Welcome back to another episode of Under the Fig Tree. Ben, how are you? I'm all right. I brought my um, purple polka dot socks today. It, so when you put your foot up, I thought you were showing off your dress shoes. <laughs> my, my enormous feet, not, oh, boat skis. Not enough people own a pair of brown dress shoes, and I don't get it. Yeah. They're this classic look. You know, I, was, I actually have two pairs of brown dress shoes. Look at that. I mean, I'm, everybody <laughs> knows that, that watches or listens to this podcast that I'm not the shoe guy you are. I, I also have two pair of brown dress shoes. And I'll they're bet both, you do. They're, they're both strapped. Anyway, enough about shoes. We are blessed to have a guest, Dr. Joel Bierman here with us today. How are you, Dr. Bierman? And I'm great. It, so it's one of those things. Uh, our listeners now know that I'm a graduate student. So like there was a time when I was an MDiv student and you were Dr. Bierman. Then I graduated. And for a while, I called you by your first name. Mm-hmm. And now, I'm a, not, now that I'm a student again, we both work yep. at the seminary. <laughs> Uh, and I still have classes to take, so there's an opportunity for you to still teach one of my classes. Yeah, yeah. And there's also, I'm in the department that you teach here, so there's also an opportunity that you become uh, an advisor or a mm. reader in my dissertation. So it is still Dr. Beerman for the time being. Yeah, I, so, I, I, I get that. <laughs> all right. <laughs> you know, because some professors... for me. <laughs> some professors, when well, it's Ben, yeah, yeah, it's just Ben. Right. But sometimes, like... I'm not going to be a reader of his yeah, dissertation. Yeah, right. I'll, I'll, I might read it someday, <laughs> but... I'll, I'll be speaking to a faculty member and I'm like, oh, Mike, could call me this. I'm like, uh, when I get done with classes, maybe. But yeah. but for now, it's still, it's just, That's it's fine. It's just respect, right? That's really all it comes down to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I don't want to offend. I want, I want good grades. So <laughs> yeah. you never know. So our, our listeners might, or our, our viewers, mm. um, we have both on this, this podcast, might know you from, um, There's a whole treasure trove of videos out there of you teaching Introduction to Systematics on uh, scholar.csl.edu and um, lots of other stuff. So uh, just tell us, give us your your basic intro um, of what you do here at Concordia Seminary, how long you've been here, that kind of thing, what you teach. I teach in the Systematics Department, so I've been teaching since 02, I guess 20 years now, and time goes fast. I was a parish pastor for 11 years before that. Love that. Uh, love teaching. I have a special interest in ethics, um, more contemporary source of theology, source of questions, and so that's kind of what I do. Yeah. Yeah. You have a, a book on ethics? Well, I've, yeah, I've got a few books, a couple books. Um, one is Case for Characters, just kind of the laying out it's my dissertation and then i have i'm really interested in two realms issues yeah. of the uh, left hand right hand church state kind of stuff more broadly and that book's called holy citizens so, yeah 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 that's exciting and um i i'm proud of our faculty that continue to publish yeah. and put things out not just for our own circles that's what i'm always concerned about is yeah. are we just kind of in a sound chamber talking to ourselves um but really putting it out there uh, beyond oh, just yeah. our circles. Yeah, yeah, no, we can put it out there. Whether anyone reads it, that's another question. Well, that's a but... whole different question. But, <laughs> but at least we're trying, right? At least oh, yeah. we're, no, we're, I, we're I not agree. just saying, hey, this is just a conversation among our Absolutely. small church body. This is... No, that's, that's that goes even to, you mentioned grad courses and the things we read and the things we interact with. Yeah. And it's important to pay attention to what's going on in the church more broadly than just our parochial little intra nos kind of yeah. thing. Absolutely. Yeah. I, so uh, before this term... Uh, so this term I'm taking cultural anthropology mm. f- from a theological perspective is very fascinating to me and yep. Luther's doctrine of justification. But last term I took your course on ethics, uh-huh. which for me stretches, but that's the point. That's yeah. why we do grad school. I, you don't want to be comfortable, but I took pneumatology with Dr. Sanchez yeah. and uh, reading Pentecostal leanings of third article theology and other all these other doctrines of third ar- article theology leading towards uh, spirit Christology, which is Leo's big thing. I, I was like, this is this is challenging stuff. I don't know no. I'm supposed to interact with it, but man, it, sometimes it, it starts good and you start to get into it. Like, yeah, I'm really feeling what you're saying. And they say one thing and it's like, 
Why'd you have to say that? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, right. Well, um, somebody, one of my, my son's professors actually has this image, which I have liked a lot. He said, you have to know when to get off the bus. Mm. So, you know, you're riding along with somebody, but mm. you get to a certain point, okay, now, now I'm done. Yeah, and that's yeah. when you get off. And some people don't know when to get off, and they get into trouble. Sure. And other people are so afraid to ever get on, they won't ride. And so yeah. the key is knowing when to make the oh, that's decision. A great, that's a great image. Yeah. You, you mentioned that you teach systematic theology. Yeah. So for, for some of our viewers or listeners that uh, that term is not familiar, right. what, what's your basic definition of what is systematic theology? Yeah, there I usually try to start by sort of situating where it fits with everything else at the seminary. Yeah. Uh, for a couple of centuries, ever since Schleiermacher messed things up, we've divided the seminary education into four categories. Right. Um, and I call that messed up because I think it's not good, but we live with it. And so we have exegetical, historical, practical, and systematic. And exegetical does the important stuff, reading the Bible. Um, historical... What do we? What is the church taught? Where? What do we? Especially the Reformation stuff. Where do we come from? Big deal. Um, practical. Pre how to preach. How to be a pastor. Really important. So what's left? Well, nothing important. Because um, everything matters. Bible, doing it. But systematic theology is what's left, and that's where we essentially try to systematize the teachings of the church, right. which is in, isn't just regurgitating what we've always taught. That's historical theology. Mm-hmm. Well, they don't. <laughs> that's not fair to them. But oh, I like they're, that. They're not here today, so <laughs> that's their problem. Um, so that's their thing. Our thing is to take the theology and apply it. And so this gets into your cultural anthropology right. thing because good systematic theology is always paying attention to what's going on in the context of the world around us so that we're speaking God's truth effectively to that world. Yep. And that's what we do. And so there are two strands of systematic theology. One is confessional. You know, what do the confessions teach? The other one is more doctrinal. I'm the doctrinal side. I'm more interested in the, the teachings of the church and how they actually play out and what they mean when we're putting them into action. Yep. Yep. Excellent. So so you said you were a, a pastor for 11 years yeah. before you came to Concordia Seminary. So as we often do with a lot of guests that we have on the show um, who went into professional church work or especially into the Office of the Holy Ministry. Uh, Tell us your story. Uh, did you did you grow up like were you born and you just thought man the the best thing in life that I could ever do is be a pastor or was there a journey there and and what what helped you to eventually get to seminary? Yeah. Well, my story is interesting because it's not interesting, and I think that's important because people, I think, too often are waiting for the lightning bolt right. or they're waiting for the feeling, yeah. you know, this, this, this strong call, this strong compulsion. I never had a compulsion, mm. ever. I never had a lightning bolt, ever. I grew up in a parsonage. My dad is a pastor. I watched him doing what he did, and I watched the whole, our whole life revolving around the work of serving the church. And so when I grew up, I wanted to be in a fighter pilot. Um, and my mom told me I wore glasses that wouldn't work, which I found out later is probably not true, right. but it worked really well because it kept me from doing it. <laughs> so my mom achieved her purpose. And then my other one was, I was going to be an architect, so I like building stuff. Um, and then, and I went to college and then, so I just went to Concordia Ann Arbor because that's where you should go. And then I just went, well, I guess well, I'll go pre sound We called it pre-men back in those days, mm-hmm. pre-ministry. And so that's what I did. And then I guess I should go to the seminary. So I went to the seminary and then I got a call and I became a pastor. So that, it just happened. So it was always just kind of a given. It just, I never really consciously thought about it. I never said, this is really what I want to do or I have to do. It just kind of happened, which is how most of life works. Yeah. So, so I think that's helpful for our listeners who, yeah. uh, we talk to a lot of people who are, because of especially our American evangelical context, we're kind of uh, conditioned to think of uh, I, we're, I'm waiting for that lightning bolt moment. Yeah. I'm waiting for um, the the feeling. I'm waiting for some passion. Right. Um, uh-huh. And and we talk to a lot of people who say, "Well, I haven't gotten that yet, and so I think it's not right. It's yep. not the right time." Yeah. You brought up two of my favorite terms to, to really harp on. One is on um, God's will. And so, what is God's will for my life? I'm trying to figure out. I'm trying to discern God's will. Well, that's a game. That's, yeah. that's, that's a farce uh, oh. because God's will is what he's told us to do in his word. That's right. it's called the law. Yeah. So that's God's will. Um, the formula of Concord says so. You want to argue with me, you're arguing with the confessions. Formula of Concord says the law is nothing more than God's will for the life of we live. So that's God's will. So do all those things. That's, that's what you do. But then it, it doesn't tell me where to go to college. It doesn't tell me what to do with my, with my career because those things aren't that important. 
And we, what do you mean they're not important? Well, they're really not. What's important is that you're doing what God put you here to do, which is to serve those around you. So then the question really becomes, what do I need to do? What should I do with what I've been given? And that's where you start getting other things like the parable of the talents, you know, the idea of being faithful in your vocation. Those right. things start kicking in. And now it's a matter of doing what I've been given to do. And so then my second big thing you mentioned was my passion. And I hate that word. Um, <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> <laughs> hate it. Yeah, you know, my, my, I'm going to do my passions. Who cares about your stupid feelings? <laughs> Who cares about your passions? It, it, that does, what's, it's not about you. It's about you serving your neighbor. And if you pay attention to Lutheran theology and Christian teaching, this is fundamental. Yep. God gives us everything, and then we die to ourselves, and we serve our neighbor. Yep. You don't matter. And so the question really becomes, and this I realize in the retrospect is kind of what I was doing all along, is you look at yourself, what am I wired for? What, do I, what skills do I have? What assets have I been given that I can use to serve my neighbor? How can I do that well? And pastoral ministry gives you all kinds of avenues to use, all kinds of skills. And so am I using those well? And not to monopolize all the time here, but no, just, no, no. I'll just jump on this now. The reason I came back to the seminary to do my PhD and end up teaching was for the exact same reasons. So it was in a self-assessment. Am I using what I've been given well? Mm -hmm. And I was getting told by too many people, you should be teaching, you should be teaching. I think, ah, you know, I like what I'm doing. I really did. I loved being in the parish. But you should be teaching. And so it was just became a matter of, I didn't want to stand on Judgment Day and God said, what'd you do with that teaching talent? I taught Bible class every Sunday. You know, I, I didn't want to be responsible for that because yeah. I felt an accountability and responsibility of the parable of talents really weighed heavily on me. I preached everybody else to do it. I thought, I need, need to do it too. Mm. So that's what drove me back to the mm. seminary to do my, my doctoral work and end up teaching was that same sense of accountability to use what I've been given. And it's not a matter of what I love doing. I, I enjoy it, no doubt about it. But my love for it isn't what drives me. What drives me is my sense of responsibility and my obligation to those around me. Yeah, and especially because they told you you, you should, should be thinking about yeah, this. Yeah, that, that didn't help. When I had people telling me, you know, <laughs> you've got this, you should be doing something. Like, oh, fine, this is probably God talking to me. I don't want to hear this. But yeah, I, well, and, and first, don't worry about the conversation. Our, our listeners hear me and Ben blabber on <laughs> yeah, they, every, every they single don't, week. They yeah. don't watch it to, to, to hear us blabber. Okay. Uh, but but there were a couple of things, because I, I, I don't deal with it all the time. I receive it all the time where somebody calls me and they, they say, I've been having this internal tug pull towards ministry. And I always yeah. say, that's fine. Uh, I, I don't like take it lightly and I don't want to discourage people, but I also let them know, I'm like, just so you know, in the grand scheme of things, that internal call isn't the determinative factor of whether or not you're fit or will ever be a pastor. Right. I was like, the thing that will determine whether you're a pastor or not isn't even graduating from the seminary. It's being called to serve a place that's right. as their pastor. And that's the only validation that matters to the church. Uh, and, and so Sometimes people have to wrestle with that generationally. I think you can frame it in such a way that people understand. Because, I, I mean, to have a desire to serve the church is good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, but then I also tell people all the time, because, again, I don't want to discourage people from coming to school here because it's, it's literally my job to convince yeah, people to come to school here. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, but, but sometimes in conversation, you're having a conversation with somebody. Um, and, and in this American context, just because you're Lutheran or that your dad was a pastor or all these other reasons why you think you have a right to become a pastor, that's also not the case. Right. Uh, but but just framing it up for them so that they understand what this is about. It, like you said, it, people ask me all about these things all the time. What's important? And I say, well, not me. It's the gospel. Don't build me up. Don't like look to me as like the authority and author of all truth. No, that's Jesus. Yeah. And, and so um, there was something else you, you threw in there that I wanted to get at when it came to recruiting and thinking about ministry, internal call, the right part. Um, well, we'll just skip past it, but uh, but just putting all of these things into framework as people are thinking about this, mulling about it, but also for the sake of the church. Oh, the encouragement part, because it was the same thing. No lightning strike for me. No internal call. Uh, when I began my path toward ministry, it was very random and I was very reluctant. Yeah. But there were people in my home congregation that were looking at me squander talents and things like uh -huh. that. And they saw me teaching Bible study and at a summer camp at our congregation, they were like, isn't kind of obvious that you should go into some type of youth ministry or something like that, yeah. become a pastor, Micah. And then I was like, I don't know. And then eventually yeah. they convinced me. And so it, we, we've talked about uh, Acts 6 all the time. Like, listen, I tell people all the time, all right, you've had this internal call. What does your pastor say? 
What do your parents say? What do your friends say? What do the people you go to church with say? Yeah. That's kind of how we validate the internal call yeah. through the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters of Christ, mm -hmm. recognizing something in you and saying, hey, like you might have a talent for this. Maybe you should pursue it. Yep. Absolutely. God, God directs and guides things so that, you know, even though I'm not an enthusiast of, you know, God's working and directing all these things, but he does, mm -hmm. and he's in charge of all these things. To be able to say, this was God's hand is always, you know, a risky move, but we can recognize these things in retrospect, and, and we... we the key, I guess, is what I'm getting at is to realize that our lives are not our own to determine. We're not these yeah. autonomous individuals who have to choose my path, which is a burden and is also a, a falsity. The, the truth is that we're always in relationships in these community things, and the community guides and leads you along to where you should be. Yeah. And uh, so one of the things that we want to talk about today, and we're already um, well on the, mm -hmm. the way, is the doctrine of vocation, yeah. which, which really, um, I, I think... Luther uh, has had a lot to say um, in kind of not creating, but at least uh, distinguishing, pointing it out, and really making oh, yeah. a lot of use out of it. Huge. And um, especially as we uh, live in America today, mm -hmm. as people are wondering about their passions, and they, it's all this turn inward, uh, the doctrine of vocation is um, extremely useful. So tell yeah. us a little bit about... Where do you start when you're talking about the doctrine of vocation? Um, yeah, even even um, things that that our our listeners, our viewers might might eventually read. Um, mm -hmm. I think further reading is always uh, a, yeah. a good suggestion. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about doctrine of vocation. Well, we could talk a long time about this. <laughs> good. Um, so the word vocation itself, of course, has a Latin root, like so many things, either Latin or Greek, and this one's Latin, vocare, it's literally to call. And so the doctrine of vocation is emphasizing the idea that we've been called into things to do. In other words, it's not something generated from inside, but it's coming from outside, which is mm -hmm. the first big thing. And so we can think about vocation in its most broad kind of salvific way of, this is God calling me to faith. And the Bible does talk this way. Paul will talk about not many of you were of importance when you were called. And there he's thinking yeah. about being called into the family of God, into the kingdom. So that's the call of faith itself. So that's the first move to make. And we don't want to blow past that because that's important because we get called into the church. Now we're called to be God's people. That's great. That's gospel in action. And that's all God's gift. But then there's also the second level, and this kind of gets into the two kinds of righteousness sort of thinking as well. So now we're called into faith relationship with God, but God also then calls us into areas of responsibility. Robert Bene has this nice phrase. He calls this some um, places of responsibility, which is mm -hmm. just another name for vocation or the German Stand or the um, idea of Amt, you know, and all these ideas are all kind of getting the same, same concept is that God places us into relationships and those relationships come with interdependent um, responsibilities toward others. Right. So that's what the heart of vocation is. When you hit, hit it this way, you begin to realize that vocation is most important in the context of the givens, like vocation of son. That's my first vocation. Mm. So I have a son, and that starts when I'm a newborn. So does a baby have a vocation? Yes, be a good baby. And that means cry and make your parents miserable or happy or whatever. And that's your vocation. And so it begins, so I have son, then I have siblings, and then I have friends, and then I have teachers. And so those are all responsibilities. Right. So then I get older, I end up having a, a, with a spouse, and that happens to you. And that's usually for most men, not something they choose either, it just <laughs> happens to them. And some woman decides it's going to happen, and it does. <laughs> and then you end up with kids, and that's usually not your idea either. And, <laughs> and so father and spouse and these things are all happening to you and they're all creating responsibilities and that's vocation and so then you say okay now i've got the i need to take care of this family i need to you know contribute to society what career should i do well now it's a vocation that you're kind of choosing but as i've been intimating even those things aren't often choices as much as givens based on what you have based on where you are based on what the circumstances are so it's not weird that kids grow up doing what their fathers do why because that's kind of the vocation they've been given and yeah, in popular American parlance, I think if if vocation ever comes up, it's kind of like career exactly. or something like exactly. that, right? This That's is right. my vocation, and and we're we're kind of conditioned in our culture to think, choose, go out and choose your vo your career, choose your yes. vocation, uh, do what makes you feel good, or follow you your know, passion. Fo follow your passion, follow your heart. Yeah, and and that becomes a 
crushing burden for junior high kids and especially high school kids. Yeah. And then the, the, you know, infamous college freshman who has no idea what their major is going to be. And they right. have this angst because they've got to decide. Yeah, it's a crushing, horrible burden. And especially for the Christian who doesn't want to make a mistake and violate God's will. And now they're really in a burden. And yeah. see, that's all just nonsense we've created in the mod modern world. I, I spend a ton of time visiting high schoolers and from and junior high and from sixth grade all the way up to 12th grade. I ask this question around vocation. I say, who knows what they want to be when they grow up? And usually it's, it's maybe around 10% of the kids yeah. raise their hand. I want to be a nurse or a doctor. And they have these really high level, yeah. I'm really good at this, I'm gonna pursue that. And you look at the the other 90% of this high school seniors and they're shrugging their shoulders. And I said, that's 100% fine. Yeah. Uh, I, I went from, I, I changed career paths many times. First you take a test and say, you're good at math and science, be a doctor, you yeah. can make a lot of money. So I started going that way. And then I took accounting, it's like, oh, you're really good with numbers. Well. The test already told me that you can make a lot of money being in finance <laughs> or accounting. So I went that way. And then I started tutoring classmates in calculus. And then I was like, oh, this is actually joyful and I'm good at it. Yeah. And I, so I tell them if you can find a vocation, right, where purpose, joy, um, and faith all come together, there's nothing wrong with that. Oh, yeah. And, and uh, like, definitely don't. Take do a job that you're gonna like when you're miserable going to work every day, mm -hmm. like because the money and everything won't fix that. Mm -hmm. And and so then I get the opportunity because I'm the director of recruitment. By the way, here's this yeah. vocation where if you're if you're if you care about the church, if you care about brothers and sisters around you, if you care about the lost, this is there's potential here. Oh yeah. Uh, and and I don't think any of us here are millionaires. Ben's invested in Bitcoin, so maybe someday. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I didn't wear my Bitcoin socks today, but uh, uh, Bitcoin's got to go a long way for me. To... But cause, because they ask that as well, because, again, it's impressed upon them. And so we're talking about you have to interact with the culture going on today. I mean, these kids, are, they, they're, they're just told forever that you have to go into something where you have to make so much money so you can get married. Right. Make so much money so you can support your kids. I'm right. Like, I'm not rich. It's like, but I'm not destitute. Right. And I have a wife. I have three kids. Yep. We have used cars. We go on vacations. We have a, a fine life. And uh, again, not neglecting any of my other vocations in life, but I, I've, I was, I've been called into a vocation right. that uh, I get to do all of the things that you're, when you're thinking about your future career, you, you get to do together. And so again, and then I tell them, you don't have to be a church worker, but, but think about it. Right. And so, the, so the, the critical thing is learning to delight in this givenness that mm -hmm. God has placed you into instead of pushing against it. And that's part of the lie of our modern world of you're autonomous. Well, no, you, you need to be receptive in receiving what God gives. So now this leads into my second thing I want to emphasize with Luther's whole point. Um, as you pointed out, Ben, that um, Luther kind of rediscovered this whole thing of vocation. In fact, I'm persuaded, reading Luther and tracking through with him, that I even call this Luther's second breakthrough. Mm -hmm. And I think this was so significant for Luther. We all know about his tower experience when he discovers the gospel, whenever that is. Yeah. Um, I tend to be a late dater. I tend to put it in the early 20s. I'm not convinced in the, by 17 that he knew. I don't think he did at 95 Theses. He had some some glimmers of it, yeah. and there's definitely some things, but there, there are also right. some things where you kind of say, Oh, that makes me feel uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, he sounds pretty Roman still, yeah. So anyway, so we, we know about that breakthrough. But see, about that same time period in the middle 20s is when he had what I would call his second breakthrough, which is right before he gets married and leaves yep. the monastery. Yeah. And in this 25, is 25, right? Yep, and this is huge because it's, it's shortly thereafter he realizes, you know, if I'm really doing what God put me here to do, that happens out there in the world. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I can't escape to the monastery and run away from the world. That's not what God put me here to do. I'm not here to serve God with my life. I'm here to serve my neighbor. And then, boom, everything starts to drop into place. And that's when he writes his dedicatory letter to his father, and, you know, when he's getting ready to publish his Against Monastic Vows. And he says, Dad, you were right. Um, you didn't want me to go to the monastery. I did because I thought I was serving God and I could violate your will. I was dead wrong. Mm -hmm. And I need to I need to repent of that. I was I was doing what the opposite of what God wanted me to do. And this is why he just continually blasts the work of the Cartesian monks who are doing these self-chosen works of piety. Mm -hmm. They're not doing what God gave them yeah. to do. What did God give you to do? Honor your father and mother. Mm -hmm. You're not. 
And you see, that's huge. Because then, and that is consistent with all Luther does. You read the large catechism, it just comes through again and again and again. So what's the point of Christ coming and redeeming and sanctifying and making me whole and complete? Is it so I can die and go to heaven someday? No, it's so I can be the human he created me to be starting now mm. and into the eternal kingdom. Mm. So now I start serving in the world. And that's why Luther says in his Galatians commentary, when I have the righteousness of Christ in me, I return to another kingdom, back into the world. Mm. And what do I do there? My vocations. I yeah. serve as a father, as a magistrate, as a preacher, as a servant. I do what God has given me to do, and I serve my neighbor. And then this is my favorite Luther quote. I've just really been jumping on this lately from early in 1520. This is right when he's, this is all coming together in his essay, The Freedom of the Christian. Mm -hmm. And this, there's a line in there that just captures it so well. He says, so a Christian lives outside of himself. He lives in faith toward God and in mm. love toward his neighbor. Mm. And so in faith, he moves above himself toward God, and in love, he descends beneath himself to his neighbor. But the point is, it's never about me. Yeah. It's receiving what God gives me, and then it's receiving the vocations God gives me, which are played out in my outward-focused love and service to my neighbor. That's what vocation's all about, It's doing what your neighbor needs you to do and serving them. And so why be a pastor? Because the church needs good pastors. And why, why do this? Because you are able now to serve their need in a very special way, and it's a blast doing it. So that's a good thing, too. So it's really important for something to come outside of us and to, to come to us. So um, the, you, you used some Latin already. You, you talked us through uh, vocat vocare, vocatio, yep. uh, which name Micah. of our high school event. Uh, it starts June 24th, 2023. Right. Registration will be open January 1st. Please come if you're in high school. <laughs> nice commercial. Perfect. Um, but there's another great Latin phrase um, for outside of us, uh, and it's extra nos. Uh -huh. And um, there's this, there's this uh, uh, student of yours mm. um, that wrote this album called Extra Nos, mm -hmm. uh, Flame. Yeah. Uh, and he, um, he kind of had, you were talking about Luther having a breakthrough. Flame yeah. sort of had a breakthrough, at, not sort of, he did have yeah. a breakthrough at Concordia Seminary, sitting in your class, probably listening to you talk about yeah. things like vocation, yeah, right? It's, it's so weird because he was just Marcus Gray, yeah. and he <laughs> just sat in the front of the class, and he was a sharp student, and yeah. didn't say a lot. Took notes like crazy, wrote solid papers, and that was great. And I, what I knew of him was well, he wasn't Lutheran, I kind of knew that a little bit, but that was it. And um, so, yeah, and he paid attention. So it's, it's fun because I've listened to his EP, just yeah. got a curiosity. And, you know, it's, and I've enjoyed it because it, it cracks me up when I listen to it. It's like class notes set to, <laughs> set to the, the, the hip hop beat. If anybody <laughs> ever wants to know what the no. classes were being taught that, that uh, Flame sat yeah. in, just just listen to extra notes. Um, Literally, some historian someday will be able to oh, compare. It's just like bang, your bang, class bang, bang, notes bang. to yeah. <laughs> just, and and there's this great the last track. I was just I was just um, uh, sharing this again with my kids because uh, um, my kids are in junior high and high school okay. and you know constantly struggle with this question of what's cool and yeah. all that kind of stuff. And and here's Flame saying that these these basic teachings that we talk about here at Concordia Seminary all the time, he, he says them in ways that are really cool. Yeah. And in the last track, I played this for them because um, they're listening. They're like, oh, this, is, this sounds really good. Uh -huh. You know, I need to listen closer because I'm not sure I understand it all. But in the last track, <laughs> Flame actually calls out Concordia Seminary, and he has a shout-out to Joel Bierman. Yeah, yeah, he does. It's it's. Kind Did of... you ever think that in your teaching <laughs> career that a rapper would would no. uh, call you out and and have a shout out in a positive way? To no, the, and I didn't think that would happen. Yeah, that, that's that, that's. That. But but that's kind of how vocation happens. It We're does. Just doing our thing. That's right. And things. Yeah. Let's stick with vocation a little bit because we also we vocation is usually a individual type of thing that we talk about, and I don't know if I've ever read and. You guys will know. About, I'm thinking about corporate vocation, mm -hmm. if that's a thing, uh, because we're talking about Flame. When he came here, he was Calvinist. He always talks about it. Listen to Lutheran doctrine, Lutheran teachings. And then, you know, if you grow, I always say this, and it, it's a very arrogant Lutheran thing to say. But if you've grown up in the church, and you've never encountered Luther and you've been reading your Bible your whole life. You'll read Lutheran doctrine. and You'll be like, oh, this is actually a little bit better. If I, I won't say perfect, because that's a little too bold, but you'll compare it to what you've learned mm -hmm. in thought about God's word, and then you'll be like, oh, I think maybe 
these guys have it down a little bit better than what I was taught. And I'm bringing this up because this week, uh, one of our admissions officers, Jesse Keeker, had a conversation with a guy who's a deacon in the Kojic Church, came across Luther. And what, what church? <clears throat> the Church of God in Christ. Oh, oh, oh okay, okay. Kojic, sorry. Yeah, yeah, Kojic. Okay, All sorry. these acronyms. No, 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 no I just didn't hear you. The, no, okay. and that was good that you asked because people okay. listening okay. may or may not know. Uh, and so he came across Luther. And now he's thinking that not only does he want to be Lutheran, but he's thinking that maybe he should come here to get his MDiv to become a Lutheran pastor. Yeah. And so I, I, I experienced this as a domestic missionary in Ferguson in my first call, where I would encounter people. There was we had these stats of people like they, they asked a question wrong. It was like, do you go to church? Yes or no? And yeah. like ninety percent of the people didn't go to church. Well, then when I encountered everybody, almost. 98% of the people had grown up in church, but left for one reason or another. Right. And often it was because what they were being taught or what was being preached didn't line up with the world. If yeah. you love God, he'll give you money. Uh, if you love God, you'll stop sinning. Well, yeah. good luck with both of those, by the way. Yeah. Uh, and then they would sit in my office and they would encounter the gospel. What I was taught, like, no, like, yeah, you're, you're a sinner beyond a shadow of a doubt. But in your sin, Christ still died for you. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, you know, I'd have people who spent 10 years in prison crying in my office because they heard the gospel for the first time. Yeah. And so it's, it's one of these things where we do, we, I, not only do I think we think we do, but we have this rich doctrine, this rich confession that uh, we work to share. What do you think about this idea of corporate confession and not just sharing our doctrine with the rest of the world, but with the rest of the church and those who are lost? What, what do you, what do you think? And this could be a, a nowhere question where do you think we struggle with the most to get across what we believe teach and confess in as far as our to the world you mean yeah outward beyond the lutheran church well i'd say we struggle first in making sure we understand it ourselves oh. um i'll start there i i always like to start at home and make sure we're doing things right and so i'm i'm very much on on the campaign of help making sure that our own people are being well catechized right. know what they actually believe um, and are really grounded in this because I, I'm s s deeply concerned about the level of moralist therapeutic deism at work in our own churches. It's not just an out there problem. Right. And so we need to make sure that our people are well grounded. And I guess I think that's probably about 90% of it, sure. frankly. So that if we get our people who begin to realize what it means to follow Christ now and what it means to live in the reality of the gospel and in the reality of their vocations to serve those around them and start to invest deeply in that, that can't help but make a difference. Mm. And see, and I and I look at even the model of the early church. Why did the early church grow like gangbusters? Was it their great programs? Was it their great outreach? Was it the fact they had Starbucks at the church? No. Uh, what what made them effective was these are people who are actually living this life of following Christ, and they believed it. And the people around them knew they believed it and realized there was something there that was lacking for them. And this is exactly what you're talking about when you have people sitting in the office in your place in Ferguson who for the first time encounter God's truth, it blows them away. Right. And so the thing we need to have is a church that has the courage to live that different way and then to express that into all their vocational areas as nurse and accountant and math teacher and all the things that they're doing in their lives where they encounter real people and can live God's reality and then speak God's truth into those situations. So I think that's the biggest part of it is we need to make sure that we get it ourselves. And then, as you've hinted at before, Ben, I know we've talked about this before, it also is you don't become so insular right, that yeah. you're afraid of. We have to preserve ourselves and keep ourselves pure. The pure doctrine doesn't, is never vulnerable. It's not fragile. Yeah. Um, God's, God's truth is, is quite robust and quite capable. And th th that's one of the things Bob Kolb taught me is just, you know, don't be afraid of interacting. you got nothing to lose yeah. because we know where we're standing. We know what we believe, and we know this is solid. It can handle anything. So we don't need to be insular. We also need to make sure that we're um, cultivating our people the right way so that, you know, there's a, a trade-off here. You know, I'm all about insulating kids and you know those weak in the faith but so far as us you know we we have to hold back from the world no we can jump out there and do all kinds of stuff and we don't need to be afraid of interacting with un unbelievers because we know what we're what we're doing and what we're teaching yeah i want to kind of take us in a different angle um in thinking about vocation and how it can be helpful to the the uh, individual christian living out their daily christian life um is encountering the bad day 
Yeah. Right. We all have bad days where we think, man, uh, <laughs> this this current station in life stinks. Yeah. Um, I don't know that uh, you know. Maybe it's struggling in a job. Maybe it's struggling with uh, parenting or struggling with being a child of a parent. Um, and there, there's something about uh, having a bad day that makes us question everything. Mm. And and all of a sudden, there's like no foundation under us. Yeah. Um, and and I think vocation can help with that. Um, to to kind of so when we're having a bad day and we're starting to j- just go more and more in, yeah. Um, how does vocation help the the believer in that kind yeah, of situation? Yeah, no, that, that's an excellent point and. I, it's good for you to bring this up. I haven't thought about having a bad day for a long time. <laughs> I was um, going to ask if you have ever had a bad day, and I thought, well, that, that maybe is a little bit too much kind of cutthroat. <laughs> no, it's, you know, there are disappointments. My bad day is mostly when I think, you know, I, I didn't get as much done as I should have today. Yeah. I, I was squandering my time. That, that's a bad day. Um, but as far as, you know, questioning, not so much. But you're right. This is a reality of, you know, of these things. This is not working the way I thought it should. Just, everything's kind of coming down on me. And I think vocation is critical in this. And you're, yeah. you're, you're obviously right to bring this up because what vocation does is it takes you out of yourself and being so self-reflective. And yeah. this is this is an epidemic problem in Christians is they're just so inward turned. You know, what's my motive here? When am I doing the right thing? Am I being righteous enough? Am I holy enough? What, what do I need to do? And those are all the wrong questions. The question is, what does, what does my neighbor need? Mm-hmm. And the vocation pulls you outside of yourself. So when you're having a lousy day for whatever reason, tires flat in the car or the teacher thought you were an idiot in class, you embarrassed yourself, whatever it is, the vocation reminds you, wait, the, my responsibilities are still there. The people who are depending on me are still there. I still have things to do. And you get back to doing those kinds of things. And that's where even like habits start to kick in again. And you're doing the things you need to do in your vocations. And that's what pulls you through and, and reminds you again of the purposefulness. This is, this is to me one of the, the really cool things about Lutheran teaching and about the doctrine of vocation is that it answers the big nagging question in the 21st century, which is purpose, meaning, yeah. what's it all yeah. about? We've got the answer. Yeah. And it's an answer that is compelling and meaningful and, and richly rewarding. And we shouldn't be ashamed of that. And so the, the guy who's having a bad day remembers, wait a minute, I'm God's child. That hasn't changed. His grace is as fresh as it ever has been. I, I know exactly where I stand. I'm part of his, his people. At death, I become part of his eternal kingdom. and I move into that forever. And the resurrection is going to be gloriously fulfilled. I know all that. And in the meantime, I have been given things to do right now. Let's get back to it. And you see, wow, that's pretty cool. I don't have to wonder and try to find meaning. It's, it's given. And I think that's why, and I was joking about, I can't remember having a bad day. I think those things flatten out a little bit and they yep. just, because now you're just recognizing it's not about me and my feelings about it and when I, whether I like it or not. It's about what it's getting done, what needs to be done. And so it's this disciplined Christian life. It's, it's the, the life that just continually turns to the other, yeah. continually turns to the outside. Right. Ultimately, because you're confident in Christ. That's and right. And you're confident in who, you, who Christ has made you to be. Absolutely. And so you, right. you don't have to spend lots of time sitting around wondering, uh, am right. I doing enough? That's am right. I... Uh, let me go deeper into myself to figure out right. if I'm uh, using all my gifts right, in the right, right way. Right, right, right. And see, it's, it's so interesting that Luther described sin as being curvatus and se, yeah. you know, another Latin phrase, curved in on yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's that kind of bent over navel gazing. And that's the antithesis of the Christian life. The Christian life is always bent out mm. and aimed out. And so when you have introspective, carefully you know, examining your heart, a little goes a long way. You know, I'll look at your heart for a little bit. You see enough sin in there to repent. Okay, now move on. And don't get hung up on doing the, so much self-introspection. Well, if you want to stay on topic, you can ask your question, because I want to break a little bit. Not completely, because... It, it was it mostly just a... Um, you had mentioned this earlier, and I think that we're on this this track, and so it will make sense uh, for where the conversation's at right now, is two kinds of righteousness. Yeah, yeah. So I was just saying, you know, because you're confident in yourself, or not confident in yourself, because you're confident in Christ yeah. and who Christ has made you to be, then you you can be outward focused. So you mentioned two kinds of righteousness, yeah, which uh, is a really big thing at Concordia Seminary, but our, our listeners, hearers, may not know 
that that um, phrase, two kinds of righteousness. So just define it okay, as uh, you would define it. Sure, sure. Um, it's yeah, it's big here, but it's not coined here. We didn't make it up. No, that's right. I, I want to emphasize this. This is something that's fundamental to Luther's teaching. Um, if you doubt me, just read his Galatians commentary, volume twenty six, the American edition, pages one through twelve or three through twelve. Just start there, and there's a good reading. Yeah. Suggestion. Yeah. Well, if I'm getting reading suggestions. I'll give you some more before we're done, good. too. But, um, so Luther taught the idea of these, there are two kinds of righteousness, and the core here is understanding righteousness. What does that mean? Mm. It means to be properly related in a good relationship. So when I'm related to God the right way, I have a righteousness before God, and that righteousness comes to me purely by the gospel. Christ does it all. It's passive righteousness, Luther calls it. Then Luther says, and now that I have this passive righteousness, I also have responsibilities in the world, or all my vocations play out to my neighbor, to my fellow creatures. That's where we do the horizontal or the active righteousness before the world. And yep. so two kinds of righteousness. And there, it's not about the gospel, because the gospel just forgives. There, it's about God's will for what it means to be human, and that's called the law. And there, the law directs me. And so the Lutheran doesn't need to be afraid of the law or get rid of the law. In fact, the law becomes the direction for what God wants me to do. And it's not, and Luther even calls it a friend, and we should love the law, which is like, Luther says this? Yes, he does. And so while the law condemns and crushes, yeah, and drives me to the need for Christ, which he gives me freely, it also then is the shape of what it looks like to be living the way God created me to live. Mm -hmm. And so two kinds of righteousness helps you be able to do both things. Yeah, it's passive. It's all gospel. It's all God. But wait a minute. I got to do something? Yep. Has nothing to do with your salvation, but it has everything to do with what God put you here to do. I wasn't so good. We weren't far off from each other. It's like we, you know, all do this theology stuff all day, every day. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because I want to, I want to throw something in. Because talking about service, talking about vocation, you you get to works. Uh, I'm not saying you. I'm just saying in conversation. And uh, I came across this quote when I was studying at Westfield House because I was challenged by one of the lecturers there. He said Luther would say works are futile. I'm like, well. <laughs> What do you mean? Like, yeah. it may be one way. Yeah. Uh, but Luther has this quote. I think he's quoting Augustine where he says something to the, the point of good works don't do anything for the inward salvation. They work for the outward salvation, meaning mm. your good works are good for your neighbor. And in some way, I'm now I'm kind of interpreting what he's saying. Like, so that through your good works as a Christian born of the Holy Spirit, it might then point your neighbor to Jesus Absolutely. if they don't currently believe. And so we we teach two kinds of righteousness, but now we're in graduate school, mm -hmm. and we get to throw in a third kind of righteousness, oh, yeah. which you bring up in your book, um, a, a Case for Character, right. uh, This that's this also horizontal outside of... So if you're looking at uh, the two kinds of righteousness, there's an intersection, but there's yep. a third civil righteousness that every human mm -hmm. is called to do by way of being human. Um and there's a point to this, but anyway, the, my point is, my point is that well, you're talking about my book, so it's all fine. We're, we're talking about relationships with people and the vocation of all this relatedness. And so I n now serve as a, in a parish part time, and I get questions from people: How do I relate to the non-Christian part and civil righteousness? Yeah, uh, this created order. This so you and you line it up really perfectly according to the creeds, where everybody is created, whether they want to admit it or not. They're created by God. Yep. And if you're a Christian, if you're a non-Christian neighbor that says, I wasn't created by God, well, you, you know that they're just lying to themselves. Yeah. You don't have to say that. Right, right. But they're lying to themselves. And then vertical righteousness, second article, third article, horizontal righteousness. And so when, when we're trying to relate to people, and people are always like, well, how do I relate to my non-Christian uh, neighbor? It's like, well, you're both human. Mm-hmm. And I, again, it's, I'm not trying to say like it's kind of obvious because for a lot of people it's not, but it's just in that. And so look at your neighbor and what they do. Are they living civilly properly or in, in a good relationship to the rest of the neighborhood? And then you can begin to lean into those types of things. Yep. And I, again, your, your book isn't about outreach, but everything we do think about is in service to our neighbor. So it is about outreach and serving That's your right. non-Christian neighbor as well as your Christian neighbor. That's right. And it was one of those things, again, where... Uh, we have two kinds of righteousness, but you introduced this third kind of righteousness, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to get it, but I'm I'm saying it so that you can give an explanation of your oh. third kind of righteousness for our listeners, because I think it's just again, I was gonna say genius, but I don't, 
I don't need to say that to your face. No, but, but it's but it's it's such a good thing to, uh, for people to understand, especially when we think about our confession of faith of who God is in relationship to us and the, what does that mean for the rest of the world. Right, right. Well, it, in essentially what I'm doing with the three kinds of righteousness, I'm just splitting out the horizontal righteousness in the world between and distinguish between a Christian and a non-Christian. Right. So it's God's law is the same law for everybody. And in other words, it's not like there's a secret list of rules that only Christians are supposed to do. What God wants humans to do is what he wants all humans to do. We're created for this. And if you understand it that way, this is consistent with Luther, that he would argue that the Sermon on the Mount applies to all people, not just a handful of really special Christians called monks. Yeah. Everybody should be turning the other cheek and going the extra mile. And so in that sense, um, you realize God's law is for everybody. So then the difference then is, well, it's not different laws. The difference is my relationship to God. So the Christian is united to Christ and so therefore is righteous before God, where the pagan, the unbeliever, the heathen is not. Mm -hmm. And so you can have an unbeliever who's doing right things, but he's not right related to God. And that's never going to save him because my right behavior in the world's realm is not going to be enough to earn brownie points for God. It's all grace. It's all reception. And so I'm just trying to get at that. And, and the advantage you're, you're pointing out is, yes, we can acknowledge that unbelievers can do good things and uh, we have responsibilities in the world and those are right things for us to do so that's that's part of the helpful part of that well and it in that way goes against everything that the world would tell you yeah uh, the world would tell you me 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 but right you can look at your neighbor like what about you makes you think that you should do something good for anybody other than you yeah and and th they would say a bunch of different things but it would all be nonsense and again i'm not much of a a uh, apologist or like for all but you get what i'm i hope you get what i'm saying is just again we're talking about purpose and a lot of times when people use that word it's me but again yeah. you you can look at your non-christian neighbors like no part of your purpose is for me your neighbor and that's you've right. just acknowledged that yeah. now where does that come from because yeah. it's not coming from the world that's right it's coming from the source the person who created you and uh you know it, it People always think they need to be clever in these conversations. I'm like, no, you just need to be a, a bumbling idiot every once in a while. Be mm -hmm. human and just, just ramble off a bunch of stuff you believe. And maybe something will stick. God works through those things, too. Yes, he does. He does. <laughs> so I want to ask about um, some reading recommendations. Maybe maybe on behalf of our listeners, but, yeah. but maybe also just for me, because I'm, I'm always looking for a good book. Yeah. Um, my wife thinks I have way too many, but... Um, you can't have enough books. It's yeah. just not just not possible. I want to start actually, though, with um, you mentioned this Luther reference where he he talks about um, the 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 Beatitudes, Sermon on the Mount, and that it's applicable for all people. Yeah. Um, I've not read that before. I'm not denying or, or yeah, yeah, yeah. suggesting that that Luther didn't say it. Yeah, yeah. I want to read that. Well, it's he's got a commentary on Matthew where he's actually rocking through the Sermon on the Mount. Okay. And that one I can't give you the reference where it's in the in the American edition, but it's there. Um, but it's in his uh, talking through Matthew. That's right. Got it. That's right. That's where he gets into that. Um, you also get this um, somewhat to the extent of. Um, Temporal authority, to what extent it should be obeyed, the okay. sense that um, God's law is there for all people, that, yeah. that, that, that sense of that going on. So that's where that's being drawn from. But I think the Matthew Good. reference would be the most significant one. Okay, yeah. yeah. I, I love Sermon on the Mountain. I think we don't do enough with that. Uh, Amen. Um, I think we, we kind of leave it off to the side. It, I'm, I'm sometimes a little bummed that it doesn't show up in the catechism, mm. um, and I... I I think it ha it's so helpful for living the daily Christian life. I'd agree. And the catechism is, by all means, very helpful for living the daily Christian life. Right. But um, yeah, there's, there's. I think it's just so rich with Amen. how to how to live out yeah. the, the well, daily life yeah. of a Christian. Bon Hafer thought so too. That's why. Well, he right, exactly. Cost of discipleship. Yeah. Well, right. And and Bon Hafer's cost of discipleship was one of the very first theological books that I ever read. Okay. And went. Oh, I. I think I could learn. I mean, I was like in I probably senior year of high school or freshman ah. year of college, and um, I was just like, oh, I, I, I kind of like reading theology. <laughs> this I is kind of fun. All right, that's cool. So, so give us some more uh, yeah. book recommendations, what, well, if we're especially talk, vocation. Yeah, yeah. If we're talking about vocation, the the one you need to look at is Gustav Wengren, Luther on Vocation. That. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yep. That that's kind of like the one who sets the table on everything. Um, there are a few, and that was that was written maybe in the. 
fifties. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, middle fifties, something yeah. like that. Written, written in German, translated in, in and also has written. I think it was German, or and then translated. Maybe it was Swedish, but because Vingren's a Swede. But um, so yeah, that that's the one to read. And there are other treatments of it. Um, Gina Vith has written quite a bit about yep. your vocation, which is good. But most of what he's doing, he's just taking out of. Vingren, and yep. he he references that. So Vingren's the the place to start on that, and that probably is the the best thing to read. I think um, Luther and even on monastic vows is actually kind of mm. interesting and helpful on some of this stuff. Not the easiest, large catechism. I mean, yeah. it's like everybody should read it, but we don't, and that just does an awesome job of laying this stuff out. Yeah. So those are the, uh, those are my off the top of my head good recommendations for a vocation reading. Good. So, so, so listeners, viewers um, should, because um, I think people who are thinking about coming to seminary are always asking us, we get these questions all the time, what should I do to prepare? <laughs> and, you know, uh, your, your colleagues in the exegetical yeah. department, the Bible department would say, work on your Greek and Hebrew, right? Yeah. Or, or um, read your Bible. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's good to be reading these, these theological books that were written um, yeah. much more recently. Yeah. That that are are still giving us good solid biblical theology, I agree. but putting it in terms that maybe twentieth century or twenty first century people especially need to hear yeah. it. And this might sound strange. So if we're talking more broadly, what you should read, I'll add another one of my favorites on that list, which is another nineteen fifties book, which is Adolf Caberly's book, mm, Quest yeah. for Holiness. That, that 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 just blew my mind when I read that, and oh, I read yeah. that like 20 years ago. It was the first time I read that. Because I, I had heard about it when it came through here as an MDiv, but I never read it because it wasn't forced on me. Because um, I wasn't that kind of a... I didn't read stuff for the fun of it as a student. I just read what I had to. Um, I wasn't that great of a student. But um, I, w- I was a nerd, and I, I was just <laughs> by myself, yeah, but, but see, I had to find a way to fill my time. I, right? I, I was one of those... You know, I, I, could, I could pull it off, but I didn't do anything above and beyond. Um, so the... The Quest for Holiness is outstanding. That's yeah. Caberly, K-O-B-E-R-L-E, um, with an umlaut over the O. Umlaut, yep. Yeah, and so that that one blew my mind. That's oh. a great, great read. But I would recommend, too, if, if guys are thinking about, what do I need to do before I come to seminary? Read some philosophy. Mm. Um, just get a good book like Diogenes Allen, Philosophy for, for Understanding Theology, or something like that. Pick up something. If you don't know any philosophy, read some, because... Plato and Aristotle and basic ideas come up all the time. Yep. And to have some clue of who these guys are and what they're doing is really helpful. And it's, it's worth doing. Even though you think, wait a minute, those are a bunch of heathen dead guys. Yeah, it doesn't matter because they influence the whole Western thinking and they influence theology as well. Yeah. I'm, I'm listening right now. Um, so I walk every morning. Uh, typically, I walk my dog, but my dog just broke her leg. So oh. I'm walking by myself. But uh, so I always have something that I'm listening to. And right now, I'm, I'm listening through Plato's Republic. Oh, really? Um, because I, I, I hadn't ever read that. My, my kid has to read it in high school. Okay. And I'm mm. kind of jealous that that's yeah. a required text for a high school student. Or no doubt. But it wasn't in my high school. Um, <laughs> and either. so, uh, yeah. And there's. There's so much about what does a good ruler do, um, separating sheep and goats. There's a whole discussion of, and I'm like, man, uh, Christians should be reading this and uh, picking up on um, maybe, uh, I don't don't want to get too far out, but I I have a hunch that Jesus and the uh, apostles uh, were well aware of the Greek literature um, mm-hmm. that existed as they were writing the yeah, gospel. So, I think you're right. Yeah. So we should probably get to... I could nerd out on books all day, but we should probably get <laughs> to <laughs> um, our our fun segment of Ripe for the Pickin' or Leave it on the Tree. Do you have one you want to go first? Uh, sure. I mean, I was, you know me. I have, I have more than one. Get your I, list out. It's, it's just the... We both have yeah, lists. I, well, Ben has gotten hip. I started this list, and it just gets added to again when when I'm out and about, uh, and then I, I highlight random ones. And I don't know why I highlighted this one first, but I don't know if I've ever asked anybody yet on the show because I, I forget. Uh, shrimp cocktail, mm-hmm. right for the picking or leave it on the tree. Leave it on the tree. <laughs> I love shrimp cocktail. Do you? Oh, I we we <laughs> always have we we get shrimp cocktail like once a year, right? Maybe maybe twice a year, New Year's Eve and Christmas Eve. Yeah. And um, 
we so so we have this bottle of cocktail sauce that we buy uh, right before Christmas Eve, and then it sits in the fridge for like an entire year because we we don't you don't what else do you use right. cocktail sauce for? Uh, why would, what do you use it at all for? Is my question. But <laughs> shrimp cocktails delicious. No man, I leave it on the tree as well. First, the shrimp is cold. Mm. Yeah, which is exactly. gross and then i don't like horseradish so oh. the, the, the food the food ones are always by far the most divisive ones between me and ben <laughs> and our probably our listeners it's like probably the most triggering thing i'm gonna leave it on the tree as well i, I wrote it down once because i was like "Ooh, who likes shrimp cocktail now i know now okay. i know the kind of person who eats shrimp cocktail <laughs> me all right next one um craft beer craft beer so um, specifically not Budweiser, which I, I just recently uh, had a few of the other night, and I was doesn't, yeah very disappointed. Yeah, it's, it's not worth drinking. It's not. Craft beer for uh, you? Yeah. Right oh, for the picking? That's, that's right for the picking. All right. Yeah. Do, you have a, do you have a favorite? Yeah, I'm, I'm a, very much a porter and stout kind of guy. Okay. okay. Yeah. So I'm not so much in the IPAs, but there are a few IPAs I like, but if it gets too hoppy, it's just not that interesting. Yeah. It's yeah. Just, you can get a little bit of wheat beers. They're all right. There was yeah. there's a brewery I, I feel like it's in like maybe northern Indiana, um, Three Floyds. They have a wheat beer called Gumball Head. Hmm. Oh yeah. And I'm not a big wheat beer guy, okay. but that one is it's nice. Right. I don't know what it what it is about it, but I'm I'm for it. All right. Yeah, yeah right for but, the picking for me. And and I we're Selena and I are both uh, my wife and I are both uh, dark beer. Oh drinkers. really? That's so me. That's glad. stouts, yeah. porters. Yeah. I I just recently uh, finished a, a stout that I had made. Um, that was kind of a clone of something called Irish Quilter's Death that oh, we had man. out in Washington State. It was fantastic. That sounds pretty good. Best beer I've ever had. Uh, then we'll move on. I, I saw Dorothy drinking a beer the other day, and it blew my mind. I was like, when did you start drinking beer? Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right for the picking, leave it on the tree. Cricket. The sport. I, I'm ambivalent. I have nothing against it, but I've never followed it. Sure. Leave it on the tree for me. When I was in England uh, do, working on my PhD, my my, my dissertation supervisor yeah. took me took me to a cricket game, and I was just like, uh, now, "Now what's happening now?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's Bastion. a good stadium. It was a, it was yeah. a cool stadium, and and I was kind of jazzed by like the whole culture of it because it was very different from from baseball. Oh, yeah. Um, but but I just had to keep asking like, "What what's happening now? Why they do that?" Um, so yeah, I, I still don't get it. I couldn't follow it the whole game. We were there for a couple hours and, and then we left and the game, <laughs> kept the going? game kept going for like another, I don't know, 10 hours Probably. or something yeah. like that. It's, I just, yeah. So leave yeah. it on the tree. i my British friends can poke fun of me. Uh, well, so when I graduated from undergrad, I had time on my hands between starting seminary. So I went and lived at Westfield house for a month, uh, for different reasons. Brother-in-law is getting married. Dorothy was there most important reason why I went. Mm. And so when they were all in class, what's on TV? Well, it's cricket. And I was like, thought I was getting it. And then they played, like they, it switched countries and the rules changed. And I was uh, like, oh, this sport is stupid. Anyway, <laughs> so let's leave it on the tree for me as well. Right. I just, I was just interested. Yeah. You never know right. who likes what. All right. Um, the next one, um, shout out to my good friend, Sam Sessa, who sent me this. Oh. Um, you know, Sam. Yeah. Um, the movie Elf. With leave it on the tree. Leave it on the tree. Will Ferrell. I've never slapstick seen it. Slapstick comedy. I've never seen it. I, I hate slapstick. I, I hate it. I hate that's Home Alone. Why I, that's why I asked. Because I, I figured I figured oh, I that it. this would be a leave it on the tree no, for I hate you. It. But like, whenever whenever in the parish, this is a different movie. But we had some parishioners told us my wife and I you should go see Home Alone. So we went to see it, and it was just, the whole audience was all laughing. I was just so stupid, just stupid. I hate it. I hate slapstick. Come come to Concordia <laughs> Seminary to. To uh, for entertainment's value, That's to, right. to watch Joel Bierman talk about things like uh, American culture. Yeah, it's, that's it's right. entertaining for me. I love the movie Elf. I hated it the first time I saw it. Okay, I, I hated it maybe the first three times I saw it. <laughs> oh, watched but, it more than three. <laughs> oh my gosh, oh, um, oh. it just plays over and over at our house sometimes. Oh, uh, no. But I I have grown. To love it as much as like the Christmas story or Christmas family vacation, which now I can't use as ripe for the picking because I've named all those. So yeah. all those great slapstick okay. Christmas movies, ripe for the picking for yeah. me. No. 
I don't know that I've I've seen Elf all what? the way through. Good for you. Yeah, I, you know, you it's, and me both. So I'm not I'm not a <laughs> hater of all slapstick things, but sometimes now this like, surprises me, and I'm gonna tell the team, and they're going to make fun of me. That's you. that's fine, because <laughs> well, because and I, it might make me culturally unrelevant, but sometimes a movie comes on and I start to watch it, and I'm just like, ah, eh, and I'm good. So I've I've never seen Elf all the way through, and it just just something about it. I don't know. I I also don't like movies that are like puppet based. And oh, so they're, oh yeah. they're stupid. I don't I don't care. People are like, oh, it's so good. I won't watch it. It's, just, it's not for me. So Elf is <laughs> leave it on the tree for me. Oh, when he puts when he puts <laughs> maple syrup on his spaghetti. I mean, or when he. Yeah, when he sings, when he sings to his dad. When you said I mean, that, so I thought you were talking about things. me. I was like, Ben, I've never put <laughs> yeah, of course maple not. syrup on my spaghetti. That's All disgusting. Right. All right. That was yours? That was mine. Right, this so. last one, right for the picking or leave it on the tree. Broadway musicals. Oh, I'm, oh it's a right for the picking. Mm. Some of them. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I love going to the Muni. So. I, you know, I, I don't know much about you outside of the seminary. Mm -hmm. I, I, we, I, we almost talked about, I was going to ask you a question about being a camp counselor because uh, you were, and yeah. I think that's an awesome thing, maybe a different episode. Uh, we'll just have to have you back on. Uh, but I, for some reason, when I was going through my list, I saw it, I was like, mm, I bet Dr. Bierman is a thespian oh. of the good arts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, uh, I enjoy that. I, I, like, I like Broadway shows. Um, I, like I said, I love going to the Muni. My wife and I go to the free seats all the time. Yeah. It's just kind of a tradition now. We, we refuse to pay for tickets. We just go to the free seats, and it's part of the, the ritual. Yep. And I, I like it. Um, some of the shows are annoying, but um, I like a lot of them. So, yeah, I enjoy it. Sure. Yeah. I, 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 if you're if you've never been to St. Louis and you're on the verge of going to seminary or not, there I mean St. Louis, as far yeah. as culture goes for a small city, is oh, rich yeah. in everything. And Forest Park is just a mile away from us. Also in the summer, Shakespeare in the right. Park, we love oh, that as well. Yeah. It's so yeah. good. Yep. Yeah. Uh, we've been to all of them. The yep. Fox. And it's all has, free. Has great I mean, stuff. We're free going and so to a far show as next week. We're very socialistic and and they charge us in our taxes to pay for all that, this. That's things. right. That's, <laughs> so we're, what are you seeing at the Fox? We're um, we're going to see. Um, Straight No Chaser, which is oh, this, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you know, this, yeah, yeah. this the, group, the acapella, the acapella group. group. The they're, they're from Indiana University, and oh. my wife went to school with a lot of them oh, at wow. IU, and so uh, some of them are classmates, cool. and wow. um, it's a big uh, kind of bucket list thing for her. Um, all right. so Good stuff. Yeah. Oh, good. So, yeah, I, w I would say um, all those kind of shows, theater, ripe for the picking for me, except musicals. No? Um, now, like... <laughs> I would say Hamilton's not a musical, but but any th like the music wait, wait, man. Wait, wait, what? <laughs> How is Hamilton not a musical? It's it's not the same kind of musical as like Music Man, where it's like like yeah, but jazz just, hands, yeah, but and, big dance scenes. Oh, I was gonna say like, no, 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 like no. Meet Me in St. Louis, none of that kind oh, of stuff. Man. Dude, I was that, I've been I would I've, I've been in musicals before. I love it. I, I have good too. Stuff. I've been in Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. I just think we, it's ridiculous. We, this past summer at the Muni, I brought up Joseph. I've got ten grandkids. Okay, and so we and two of my family that had some of my grandkids. We went to the Muni. And it was their first time. Yeah. And so we went to the free seats, the whole thing. And it was for Joseph. And it was just delightful because the oldest one is um, nine and they're down to um, the youngest one is two years. Okay. And so they were all, you know, sitting in the seats you know, on their laps and everything. And they're all just so excited, you know, just really pumped up watching it. And they're watching the, sh the stage and they're just, their eyes are lighting up. And then I knew it was going to happen. Then all of a sudden the stage opens and shows the real scene, you know, you know, and they just, they literally gasped out loud. Wow. It was just yeah. so, you know, the vicarious. <laughs> experience of watching them watch and they, they're the delight and we thought they're gonna fall asleep they were just wired the whole time for the entire show it was just so cool watching them get it huh. so oh, yeah awesome. yeah yeah yeah, it's just the show hands kind of <laughs> thing just, that yeah. that is just like <laughs> too over the top um, sometimes you just gotta lean into the that's cheese exactly man. right no, you just, 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 yeah. just, just gotta roll with it <laughs> all right so it's right for the picking for you oh big time all right so last one for me is Getting up early. Are you an early riser? Five o'clock every morning, no Amen. matter what. Amen. Same, every, it doesn't same matter. Here. Holiday, every day, five o'clock every day. I just set yep. the alarm. I never change it. Coffee? Tea. Hot tea okay. with milk. I do okay. it the British way. All right, yeah. All Love right. it. Oh, nice. Lump yeah. of sugar? Nope. Oh, okay. No. Nope. Right. 5 a.m. Uh, this morning, I, I think I woke up at, I don't know, four or something. But ah. um, I'm out of bed at five o'clock yep. and hit the road. Um, yep. I usually have some time to yep. wake up, read. Yeah. But always yep, cup of always. coffee in hand. Amen. Right. 
early bird gets the worm. Now, Dorothy will try to say something funny. I do. My alarm goes off at five, but I'm usually up before that. And if I travel for work and I'm in a different time zone, it's still, it's set in my body yeah. to get up. Yep. I just, I have RA. So some in the winter time when the, the cold sets into your bones, it just takes me a while to crawl out of bed. Yeah. But, but the same thing. It's just one of those things where like, if for some reason, even on vacation, the thought of like, where people are like, oh, I didn't get up until nine. Yeah. Like, how? <laughs> I like, know. Like, half the day is gone. I know. Right? I know. <laughs> you know, I would have to, like, have a book or my phone oh, or yeah. something yeah. to read. Yeah, um, you just get restless. Yeah. I tr- I've tried to sleep in, you know, on vacation, you know, and it gets to be, like, 6.30, 7. It's like, oh, yeah, man, like, just get going. It feels you know? weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, it does. I'm the, I'm the same. Yeah, it's just, just get up and go out. No, like, again, I'll, sometimes I'll read, and I'm sure you won't like this, but especially if I'm on vacation and I don't have anything to do, I'll get up. And if you get on the video game at eight o'clock, <laughs> the sweaty players aren't on yet, and I have no. a good chance of doing really well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Yeah. So yeah, it's right for me as well. Get up. Get up and get about your life. Yeah, man. Be a good neighbor. This has been fun. Indeed, enjoyed it. Uh, we always like to conclude. If, if so, again, we we hope that. Uh, it, our listeners are maybe thinking about church work or somebody thinking about church work and if, uh, or know somebody who they think should be a good church worker. If the, you had one last piece of advice uh, for somebody who's kind of on the fence, what would about going into church work, mm-hmm. what would that piece of advice be? Do it. Mm. Bang, bang. <laughs> You know, uh, last That's good week. Good advice. Well, don't don't spend lots of time thinking no, about think it. it. Don't go. Just don't do it. overthink it. That's right. Dion Hall, we had him on uh, recently, and he said, "Just do it." And I really wanted to lean into the Nike slogan, <laughs> and, and I, I resisted this time. We won't go on about it, but you yeah, said, yeah, "Just yeah. do it." I was like, "Exactly." Go buy some Nikes today. I, they, <laughs> I, I, one day, right? They they have all these people on their roster. They don't have a pastor. Mm. It should be me. If you're listening, Nike, I'm sure you're not. Sponsor me and send me free shoes, please. Uh, well, Dr. Beerman, it was absolute joy to have you on. I'm sure we'll ask you to be on again, uh, talk about some other topics, because okay. you know there's lots of things lots you of cover, things. two realms. I want to talk about alien residents or resident aliens, mm-hmm. which isn't Lutheran, but it goes along with what we've yeah, been talking about. Uh, but if you're listening and uh, you yourself uh, are thinking about going into church work, there's a link to our request for information. Uh, if you fill out that form and we currently don't have you in our system, Ben is going to send you a book sometime in the future. When that happens, that's up to Ben, not to me. Uh, and right now we're giving out uh, a book by Dr. Leo Sanchez, Sculptor Spirit. Maybe sometime we'll switch to, uh, I was going to say Holy Citizens, but I don't know that one as well because well, I haven't read that one. Mm. But I did read A Case for Character oh, okay. for class. Hey, I, uh, yeah, it, it is a very good book and I enjoyed <laughs> reading it. Uh, but fill out the RFI, give us your information. We'd love to be in contact with you. Uh, and as always, thank you for joining us under the fig tree. See you next time. <laughs>